You know, friends of mine told me that I'm a little bit crazy. Because I live behind this big gate, paint, paint, sculpt, sculpt. I have no contact with the outside world. And uh, I think I'm a little screw loose, you know. But I can tell you the truth. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy at all. Most everybody I know is crazy. I look around the world and I see crazy. I see crazy almost everywhere I look. I look at the television set and everything I see is insane. So maybe I am crazy, maybe I'm not. I'm not sure. What the fuck do you think? We're talking about uh, an old man who's been hiding behind a gate making art. Uh, I hide behind that gate. The gate works two ways. It keeps the world out and it locks me in. Because the world that I see outside is not so much fun as it used to be. The world that I make in here, behind this gate, that's where the fun is. The real fun. Every day, every single day of my life is fun. Because every day something new happens. Every time you put a piece of paper down and you write something on it, or you paint something on it, you begin to become real. I was born in the middle of the Depression in 1935. My parents were very, very poor people, as was most everybody in New York at that time. It was Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. Lived on Flatbush Avenue, born in Kings County Hospital, Charity, Charity Ward. My first uh, bassinet was a dresser drawer. Uh, early on, I almost starved to death at uh, three months because my mother's milk went dry and she didn't know it. I wasn't getting any nourishment. It saved my life there. A year later, I got whooping cough. Damn near died of whooping cough. Uh, had a kind of, you know, a, a minimalist existence. My father worked as an ice rink cleaner. He scraped the ice on the ice rink and he made $7 a week. That was considered to be reasonably good money in those days, but it wasn't enough to get us by. So, uh, my father was a songwriter, so we moved to, to Hollywood. He, want, he thought, well, this is a place to go because uh, that's where all the studios are, where all the stars are. And he came out here, brought us all along, and that was probably the best thing that ever happened in my life because if I'd been raised in New York, it would have been an entirely different existence. Good or bad, I don't know, but totally different. But I lived out here since 1940, back when it was just a small town. I mean, you could walk down Hollywood Boulevard, and you could see movie stars everywhere. It was just a small town. People weren't, you know, there were no paparazzi, none of that kind of thing existed in those days. It was all very, very charming. And it's gotten darker and grimier and greasier over the years, you know. So today we have what we have, which is not very pretty at all. But in those days it was very lovely, you know. There wasn't any smog to speak of, a little bit. Uh, Charlie cars, you know, st stoplights with signs that went up and down, go, stop, you know. Very, very rustic, very pretty. Check out the neighborhood. Hasn't changed a hell of a lot since I was a child. A couple of newer buildings, those are brand new. But essentially, it's still the same old street. Got a little asphalt I didn't have before. We'll move up and see if I can find a, one of the houses I was raised in as a child. That ersatz brick house with the red and white awning, that's my what do you call it? Uh, roots. Yeah, that's my roots. This is our uh, roach coach. Tommy's is the roach coach for today. For those of you who are not in the business, the roach coach is a vehicle that comes and provides food to film crews. Here we go. One of the few things in life that it's still there, it's constant. Let's go eat some. Let's try it out. I'm revisiting my childhood. Tommy's Burger, the best burger in Los Angeles. When I was a kid, this is where all the kids came to eat. As a matter of fact, many and many an art student ate their way through art school through Tommy's because the only place you could get a full meal for 50 cents. It cost 50 cents for a burger in those days. So the average art student could eat here and survive. Eat two of these a day and they'd live. So they don't know how many artists they put through art school that they allowed to survive. So I'm eating my burger, it's the best burger. Permit me to have a mouthful. It 
1952 again. My mouth doesn't know the difference. About the napkins. This is Rhapsodic. This is Joy. When I was oh, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, to give you an idea of how different things were in those days, uh, I lived in Echo Park. and It was about eight, nine miles from my home to Hollywood and a couple of miles from my home to downtown LA on my bus. And every Saturday, I'd go out, eight, nine years old, and go see two motion pictures. You know, uh, I'd go to uh, Pantages and the Egyptian theater all in one day. Uh, sometimes go see one theater and s sit for maybe two, three screenings. You can't do that anymore. But in those days, you could stay all day long. You bought your ticket and you didn't have to leave the theater. So uh, I spent a lot of time walking up and down Hollywood Boulevard, going to all the movie theaters, uh, seeing what could be seen. And a great deal of my education came from those films. Most of the kids from my generation that were not uh, raised with etiquette and all the uh, proprieties picked those things up from, from movies. We watched uh, Tyrone Power, or Clark Gable, or Robert Taylor, uh, so many of the great actors. We'd see what they would do, how they'd light a cigarette, uh, how they'd eat with a knife and a fork, uh, what kinds of words they use. Because in those days, when screenwriters wrote scripts, they were literate. Uh, they wrote, their characters spoke intelligently. They spoke in an educated patois. Not like today, where everything is fuck this and cocksucker that and motherfucker. It wasn't like that at all. People had to express themselves artfully. Even when they were laying down epithets, they couldn't curse. It was just that simple. We learned how to act from the motion pictures. But it also gave us a sense of what romance was about. Bullshit. But it was, it was what we bought. We bought the whole idea of the true romance notion. Uh, how men treated women. You know, in those days, men weren't always beating up women and women were all hoes and all that kind of thing. So I mean, we learned how to treat women, how to eat food, how to dress, how to walk, almost everything. I was like a little, little printout, you know, a little uh, morph, morphite of uh, five different actors that I would, you know, emulate when, when I walked around. The, the girls in school used to say, I was such an old kid. Uh, I seem so goddamn much more tour than more, most of my, my, my classmates. I, I think that's because I took film so damn seriously. <laughs> I, I really, I went to school there. It was a, you know, a very big part of my learning process. But the downside to all of that was the girls were watching the same movies the boys were watching, and they developed some very fanciful notions about what love is supposed to be like. I mean, in the movie, everything always gets wrapped up and the boy and the girl walk off into the sunset or, or whatever, happily ever after. They always resolve their problems somehow. And so for the girls of my generation, romance meant uh, walking off into the sunset. Everything always worked out beautifully. Well, in real life, obviously, it doesn't work that way. So my first marriage was a total disaster because my, my first wife really, it was like she was playing a part of uh, Mother Knows Best or Donna Reed or whatever the stereotype for, for uh, American mother and wife was. She was doing that all the time and not staying in touch with reality. And I, on the other hand, had climbed down off the movie bandwagon and I was living life because I had to go out and make a living and I was in the real world. I couldn't be fanciful anymore as a grown up. So that marriage went to pieces. But what happened in that marriage was fortuitous in that I did produce a child. My son Michael, my son Michael, who is ten times the man I'll ever be, he uh, is a prosecutor for the Los Angeles County uh, District Attorney's Office, and he handles, he specializes in elder abuse cases, and uh, he goes at it with a vengeance. I'm 27 years old, and I realize I've got to go to art school. I need to be an artist. I can't keep working nine to five. It's just driving me crazy. So I go to art school. And it's the greatest thing in the world to go when you're at that age because you, you're there because you want to be. Not because somebody said, oh, you've got to get, you know, uh, you've got to be a lawyer, you've got to be a doctor, you have to get blah, blah, blah. I was there because I was motivated and I learned like a son of a bitch. I mean, I got straight A's in everything. I was kicking ass all over the place. And then one day I realized, what do A's mean in an art school? You can't grade art. It's like the Academy Awards. I mean, the five movies are the best five movies of the year. Bullshit. Five actors, one of them is the best actor. Bullshit. Same thing with art. So at any rate, they gave me credit. They said, uh, you can come to Art Center and uh, we'll accept uh, your experience and your school credentials. My mentors there was a man named Lorser Feitelson. 
Uh, you might remember him if you're old enough. He had a television show at one time, uh, Feitelson on Art. He was a great expert. He also knew Picasso. He knew Brock. Uh, he knew Pis he knew all the big players in the 20s. He was a Parisian artist himself and a fine artist in his own right. And uh, he taught me well. Matter of fact, there's a story about him that's kind of wonderful. Uh, he uh, once taught Edward G. Robinson. Uh, Robinson was very well known as an uh, amateur painter. He loved to paint. Painted nicely, nice pictures. But he felt he needed to develop. So uh, he sought out uh, Lorser and he said, uh, you know, will you teach me how to paint? Show me you know, the tricks of the trade. And he'd been painting for 50 years at this time. So Lorser went over to the house, looked at his work, and uh, said, it's all junk. <laughs> Robinson said, what are you talking about? I've been painting for 50 years. You tell me I don't know what I'm doing. And Finals has said, well, the bottom line, Eddie, is uh, you just learn how to do the same thing faster. But you make the same mistakes over and over again. You know, well, Lorser was that kind of guy. He was a candid man. Oh, by the way, my full name is Federico Roberto Michele Gargiulo. Federico, hence Rico. Uh, you'll call me that. Okay, Rico, what did he do for a living? Well, he started off as a little kid working in a grocery store uh, as a box boy. Went from there to a clothing store. I was a salesman. I spent some time selling. Then I became a buyer. And then I became a wholesale salesman. And uh, then I took American clothing to Europe. Was the first American to go to Europe to try to sell American clothes to the Europeans since 1961. Uh, went over there, spent a couple of years selling stuff. Went totally bankrupt. Brought my wife and kids along. We all starved together, came back home. We went to work in a burlesque house as a doorman. If you can buy that shit, I was a, a doorman. <laughs> well, that, what is a doorman? It's a bouncer, all right? I got 18 women in there and me and a lot of drunks every night, and I'm supposed to handle the crowd. <laughs> well, I got bounced more than I bounced, but I can promise you that. But I did that for a couple of years. And uh, in the meantime, I was going to art school. So I was paying for my art school by working in a burlesque house. Uh, marriage crumbled. I got remarried to somebody else. Went from there into the uh, printing industry. Became an offset printer, a lithographer. Uh, did some truck driving. I also played in a band on weekends. I was a drummer and I, I, I sold trio. We worked for about a year and a half that way, making side money. Uh, went from there to um, handling advertising agencies myself. I was uh, uh, in charge of McMahon's Furniture Stores, which is a big chain, and Kmart, and Bullock's, and uh, Macy's, all, all different kinds of big, big outfits. I was doing advertising for them, and painting all the time. Remember, through all this stuff, uh, I'm, whenever I can, I'm working on my art. I'm doing never did any art for them. And, you know, it was a funny thing. I had, I had this mindset that I never wanted to paint on command or do art on command, because layout and design is not art. That's just a bag of tricks. By the way, that's an important thing to note right there, a bag of tricks. Almost everything in life is a bag of tricks. It's very important to learn that early on. Whether it's rocket science, or painting, or music, or you name it, banking, uh, politicians, everything boils down to a bag of tricks. And anyone can learn anything if they want to. Literally, anyone can learn anything. But the, co you know, the console there is if they want to badly. Anyone can learn. Whether they're going to be brilliant at it, you can't learn brilliant. You can't learn genius. You can learn efficiency. And everybody can be good at anything they want to be. Beyond that, it's up to the fates, it's up to the gods, whether they're going to be memorable, make impact in, in their world. And that's like myself. Uh, I strongly doubt that I'm ever going to make any impact, but I know damn well that what I do is professional. I know that I know my bag of tricks. I learned my bag of tricks and I'm really good at that bag of tricks. And I went further than that. Because when I started painting on glass, I invented a new medium. Oh, it had been done. The Persians had done it. I mean, it was four, five, six hundred year old technique. But not the way I was doing it. I was sitting in, in, a, in, a, in a little house in Glendale, in a garage, closed garage, with no mask on, with using hundreds and hundreds of cans of Krylon paint, painting on glass, air so thick you could barely see inside, all right? And I was discovering a new medium, a new way of expressing yourself, a new technology for artists to use. 
And I was pretty damn excited about it. I should explain to you what I mean by painting on glass. Uh, this picture is painted on glass. And I'm gonna disassemble it for you. Take it out of the frame and once again show it to you. Now, what I do is I paint on the back of the glass, not on the front of the glass, all right? Now, when you paint on the back side of the glass, all the processes are reversed. So if you want a picture to read from left to right, you have to paint it on the back side from right to left. Unlike normal painters who paint the background first, this process, you have to paint the foreground first and work your way backward. Even the border of the picture is painted. It's all part of the same composition. That's what I mean by painting on glass. At the very beginning, after I'd done a few pieces, I, I went back to Art Center to see Lorser Fidelson, and I showed him a piece that I'd been doing. Asked him, you know, yeah, well, Lorser, what do you think, you know? And he said something to me that uh, was the most important thing that anyone has ever said. He said, it's important work. He said, this is important. Christ, for a guy like Feidelson to say it's important, that meant a lot to me, a hell of a lot. So I kept on working, trying to develop the medium. Now the way the, way the, the creative process works for each artist is totally different. I tend to be obsessive, I tend to, to work in gushes. You, in a way you can almost say, alright, let's say as an artist, I have all these experiences in life, I've been in the military, I've lived with gangs as a teenager, uh, married. Uh. Then I went from there to marriage two, the marriage three. Currently, I'm with uh, Miss Effie, Effie Carey, that's her professional name. And uh, we live this wonderful little artist's life. We sit back here, I make my stuff. She has her work table where she sits down and spends 12 hours a day, no shit, 12 hours a day making little bits of jewelry. She makes, she makes necklaces, earrings. Uh, race, bra bra bracelets, all kinds of stuff, and it's all exquisite, beautiful stuff. And every so often she goes out to a fair or something and sells a few pieces, but uh, she, like myself, is mostly interested in expressing herself. She's also a top-rate painter. She paints beautiful pictures. Uh, one of these days we'll have some, some around here. She's kind of gotten off the track for the past few years. But she is a hell of a partner. And I'll tell you something, uh, one of the most important things in a, in a, in a relationship that's creative is to have a partner that is also a creator. It's very supportive. She's my best critic, and I'm her best critic because we don't bullshit each other. You know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And neither one goes, "Oh, you, you insulted me." And, oh, yeah, that hurts. No, and you say, "No, that's screwed up." Because of course, we're always talking di diplomatic terms. You know, darling, I, I think you may have um, slightly missed, the, you know, that kind of thing, rather than that's shit. You know, I never say that to her, and she doesn't do it with me. But she's a good critic. And uh, actually, quite often, when I'm working on a piece, I'll bring it to her like a little kid and say, you know, what do you think? You know, <laughs> trying to please mommy or, or, or whatever. And she'll go, that's very good, very good. And I'll go back and continue working. So, and she does the same thing with me. She'll hold up her jewelry. Do you like it? You know, I don't know what, what the fuck do I know about jewelry. But I know this, if it's beautiful, I'll tell you, yeah, honey, it's, you know, you're really on the money. So we got this great harmony going between us. It's a really nice experience, a dynamic, you know thought, I'd like to be an actor. And I studied. I found an old Broadway actor, gave classes, I studied with him, learned how to act, or thought I learned how to act anyhow. And uh, tried. I, you know, I interviewed, I got an agent, I did all these things. Uh, I did a, an Untouchables, a little greasy Italian kid in the background, one or two lines. Nothing big. Nothing big. However, years later, I had some minor roles in various television and docudrama productions. I also was the art director for all of the shows I appeared in. This footage is from a television production called Jack Anderson's Who Killed JFK? Can you tell which character I play? Hmm, the chunky Cuban major leading a charge up to the rooftop to capture the would-be assassins of Fidel Castro. In 
Stopped in Madness, I appeared as the drug dealer in a closet. This video was produced for Nancy Reagan's anti-drug campaign, Stop the Madness. Stop the Madness. I don't know what's happening, it's not my fault. Then, I acted the part of a drug dealer, again, in a fantasy carnival sequence for Dolph Lundgren's Maximum Power, a health and fitness video. In Cocaine Blues, an anti-drug docudrama, I play someone entirely different, a drug user. Coke is like it's uh, d the designer drug. The price is high. There were jewelry, there were, were all kinds of, you know, like little Coke spoons and razor, gold razor blades, etc., etc. And in a sense, almost advertised that they're doing cocaine, but you wouldn't see a hypodermic needle hanging from a junkie's neck. Uh, and I tried for about three or four years, and one day I realized it's not going to happen. You're not going to be an actor. But a thought struck me along the way, and it's served me ever since then, and that is, why, why have the ambition of pretending to be interesting people on film, and why not instead be the kind of person that they tell stories about on film? Be the movie yourself. Don't pretend to be the character. Be the character. So I've tried to live my life like it's a movie. All those experiences are what you dump into a crock pot, a crock pot of your life. And without you realizing it, it's always simmering. It's always simmering. And all, each new experience gets thrown into the crock pot, thrown in, and it's simmering. You're making this great stew. You have no idea you're making it, but it's being made. And then one day you lift the lid off the damn thing, mixed metaphors maybe, you lift the lid off the thing and out pops art. All of this stuff that you've been dragging along and cooking and simmering suddenly spills out onto canvas or spills out onto marble or whatever the medium is, music, whatever the hell it is that you're, you're using for your creative mode. And it all becomes form. So it's like the best meal you ever had in your life. And it's you that you're eating. You're eating your own experiences. When you put it on the wall, that's what you're putting. It's the menu of your life. It's what you have digested for all these years. It comes out and it doesn't look anything like anything. It just, that's what it is, the representation. It's a representation. It is an object unto itself. It isn't a picture of anything. The cameras you know, take pictures of things better than any painter is ever going to do. Oh yeah, painters can find the soul and blah, 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 blah. Maybe so, maybe so. But the bottom line is, for an artist like myself, representation is not important whatsoever. It, you look at it and you say, well, it, it, it doesn't look like anything that I recognize. I can't use that. It doesn't relate to anything in my life. Well, it's your job or my job to make you want to relate to it, to make you want to see it for what it is. It's an assembly of colors and, and, and brush strokes and canvas and frames and all this stuff it's all been put together to present to you to hopefully please you and most important please me I mean I, before everything I gotta please myself and then if I'm really lucky really really lucky somebody will come along and go god damn that is really cool well I went there for two years it's two and a half years school I went there for two and uh, as I said earlier Feidelson said you get the hell out of here and uh, go over to Otis, so I, I quit there and I went to Otis. And While I was at Otis, I got divorced. I'd been there for about a year, I got divorced. I learned a hell of a lot. It's a one hell of a school, it's a wonderful school. Recommend it to any young person who is on the coast who wants to learn how to, how to be a basic draftsman, that's a place to go. Anyway, I dropped out of there. So the point is, I went, almost graduated from graduate school and never had a high school diploma. I never graduated from a damn thing. I didn't graduate from high school. I didn't graduate from college, university, uh, or get my master's. <laughs> because at one point, I suddenly realized, who the fuck needs these things? They have nothing to do with art, unless you want to teach. Now, if you want to teach, you need all that shit. Okay, that's critical. If you want to be, uh, go out and be an instructor, then you have to have credentials, and you have to have something to put up in the wall and say you're a certified artist. You're a real artist. Look, it says so right here. Okay, well, I don't have one of those. But I don't need one. Uh, and nobody actually, I don't think Leonardo had a, a, a sheepskin on his wall. I know for sure Van Gogh didn't. No, 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 no artist needs uh, uh, certification. You, know, you need that for official business, not for art. Art is 
it's, uh, it's really been my entire life. But if you stop and think about it for a second, art is almost everybody's life. People just don't realize it. Art's all over the place. Good art, bad art. But there's a whole lot of art out there in the world. You just have to look to find it. Uh, my work, a lot of what I do, is going around finding crap and put it in piles and then digging through the pile as though it was a giant jigsaw puzzle. Trying to find what pieces go with what pieces. Everything that I get, you'll see all this stuff, this mountain of shit that I've got. And I know that in all of that there are, how can I put it, pieces that are destined to be together. In the same way as men and women are destined to be together, these objects, they want to live together side by side. And as my piece grows, it's as I find pieces that are harmonic, that like the other pieces, that say, yeah, I can be here with you. And eventually, after a long process, I mean, it can take, uh, oh Christ, a piece can take a year, two years to complete. Uh, after that long process, one day you look at it and you go, you don't want any more pieces. You, you, the puzzle's complete. This piece, we'll call it a work of art, we'll call it a statue, it's complete and you can walk away from it. Now what will happen sometimes, this is fantastic, is three years later I'll be working on another piece and I'll suddenly feel a lack, a need, a space that has to be filled by something I haven't got any idea what the hell that is. Suddenly I'll look at an old piece that I completed two or three years prior and I'll see a thing on that piece that wants to go on the other piece. So I start cannibalizing pieces of mine. All of my works have been cannibalized. They're constantly, organically changing. The longer a piece sits in my house, the more likely it is it will not resemble in any way what it did look like the first time I made it. It'll morph. I started going to thrift shops to buy pictures that were in thrift shops that were framed, blah, 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 but they were covered with glass. That way I could come home throw away whatever was in there and paint on the glass and I'd have the frame and the whole package right there and instead of paying 40 or 50 bucks for a frame and glass I'd pay three or four bucks for a frame and glass and I'd get a work of art to boot okay and I did this for uh, a number of months and a lot of my work is, is done on that uh, but then one day I started discovering that some really nice art was being thrown away in thrift shops <laughs> really great stuff and before you knew it, I uh, began collecting. I stopped painting, and I began looking for precious works of art in thrift shops. Now, when I say precious, uh, it's my opinion. But the one thing is, I know, I know an educated hand when I see one. I know an educated eye. I can look at a work of art. I cannot tell you what is genius. I leave that to others. I can tell you what is competent. I can tell you what is studied that dues have been paid. And so when I find a work of art that I can see professionalism and know there's dedication to, I have to buy it. I can't let it sit in a thrift shop and be degraded and sold for $2.99. Although I do get my senior discount when I do buy them. <laughs> but at any rate, I buy them to save them for myself. I bring them home. Now the ridiculousness of it is I've been doing this now for 20 years. I now have so much art I can't move around my house. Remember the Collier brothers? You heard about those guys, the ones that lived in New York with all the newspapers? They couldn't move around their houses at all. They had little pathways throughout the house. That's what I'm becoming, the Collier brother, you know? It's like art everywhere. I'm tripping over art. And there's not even any room for my art anymore. I've got so much of their art. And I've, I've buried it all. It's co-mingle. It's like, I don't know, it's like uh, schmooze. They're cohabiting and they're multiplying before my very eyes. Here we are outside the backyard of my house where I have a sculpture that I've been carrying around with me for a long, long time. This, uh, this has a history. You notice the big hand there? That's from a play. It was a big hit in 1968 here in Los Angeles. Played at the Las Palmas Theater. It was called The Beard. Now, The Beard was a two-character play that had a hand is the only prop on stage. It was the only prop. And then it had Billy the Kid, 
the male figure, and Marilyn Monroe was the female figure. Now, it was controversial because at the end of each show, in the last scene, Marilyn would throw herself down on the hand, and then Billy would go down between her legs and muff dive her. Well, at that exact moment, the house lights would go up, police would pour into the theater, everybody would be arrested, and the show would be closed down. This is two and a half weeks this went on. Finally, they just shut the show down and said to hell with it. I happened to be there the last night. So I went up to the producer and I said, how much you want for the hand? He says, uh, 150 bucks, I took it. I've been dragging this hand around with me now for, since 1968. I've had it in apartments, I've had it in yards, I've had it every place you can think of. It's been with me as part of my life. Recently, I discovered these friends that I realized belonged with the hand. And so today, they live together as one piece. This is a sculpture and it is called The Beard. to uh, make it in the world of art. You have to work. You have to do other things in order to afford working in art. Uh, fascinating fact of life is I became a television producer because I wanted to paint and sculpt, uh, which is you know fascinating since I mean, anybody in the world would love to be a producer, television producer, but for me, it was a byproduct. I got a job with cops. I went out into the field. I was one of the first guys to ever shoot police officers doing their job, wore a bulletproof vest, carried a gun, uh, did all the things you had to do to get the reality of the, of the event, and made my way up the ladder and became a producer, television producer. But I never got the job for that purpose. I wanted just to make enough money and have spare time so that I could actually do my art. So. I ended up becoming famous, <laughs> or being part of one of the most famous events in television history. The Literally, the first reality television show that has ever been on the air. No narration, no music, just what happens as it happens. All the reality shows you see today are bullshit. So where did that take me in the world of art? Well, frankly, it damn near took me out of the world of art. Because I spent all of my time sitting in police cars driving around, watching the suffering of humanity eight hours a day, six days a week. I saw dead bodies all over the place. I saw people screaming and fighting, blood all over. It was just gruesome. And that was my daily fare. I got to know some cops. I got to know the, the good side of police. I also got to see the dark side of police. But it pulled me out of the world of art and sucked me into the world of reality in a way that nobody in their right mind, except I guess cops, wants to be. By the time I was through with five and a half years of covering police action, I was paranoid. I was shut off by the world. I didn't want anything to do with anything. I stopped being creative. I threw up inside myself like a baby. I went fetal, intellectually fetal. It took me about a year and a half after, until after the show was ended for me to begin to breathe deeply again and start getting in touch with my real self. The gate went up because I didn't want any of that shit seeping into my home. I wanted it far, far away. And that's the best I could do, was that gate. And from Cobbs, I went to, to another show called American Detective. I produced that. And from there, I went and produced a show called World's Wildest Police Chases. You might have seen it. And another one, World's Wildest uh, Police and Videos. You might have seen that, too. Matter of fact, they're playing all the time. So that's, that's the whole panoply of my life. Uh, I've done some wild things. I mean, the, the, the two years of the Brillis House was like, every night I'd go to work, it was like a matador before we went into the bullfight. You know, they're in a suit of lights and they're down praying the Virgin Mary. Well, every night I'd go to work and I'd be in my suit of lights, my tuxedo, thinking, Christ, what's gonna happen to me tonight? And uh, it was an interesting period of time in my life. Very interesting. You know, everything I say has got to be qualified as me. You, know, you, you, you can say things about the artist, artists, you know. Well, this is just about me, the way I look at things. Um, I believe that everybody I know has an artist living inside them. There's a, there's a little piece of them that wants desperately to create, but they haven't been given either the encouragement 
uh, the circumstances, motivation, whatever you want to call it. And they never explored that part of their nature. But it's a funny thing, <laughs> you know, to show that the, the instinct is there. You go to any old person's home, anyone in the country, and what do you have the old people doing? Weaving baskets, making little paintings by numbers, doing creative things, because at the end of your life, that's the only thing left to you is to create little things. They're creating. They're dying and they're creating. Instead of having created while they were living, as they're locked up in these, 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 these beehives of misery and age, they sit around creating things. And they're very proud of these things. They show them to the, the, the very few visitors that come to see them, their grandchildren. Look what I did. Look what mommy did. Look what grandma, grandma did. Uh, we all want to be artists, and we all are artists. You should not allow people to criticize any effort that you make, because it's all valid. My art, you're going to look at my art, you see my art, and some of you are going to go, what a pile of shit, what steaming crap that is, it's just, just bullshit. Well, you're right. You're right, because art is what is perceived. And if you say it's shit, it's shit to you. Now, I'm not going to challenge you and say, well, you don't understand, and you're not smart enough, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's like pornography. You know, the, what, the, what the guys say, you know, I don't know what it is, but I know it when I see it. Well, it's the same thing with art. Everybody has the same attitude about art. I don't know what art is, but I know what I like when I see it. All right, fine. That's a valid point of view. I work in a subjective way. My paintings are... They're what they are, they're, they're, they're visualizations of thoughts. As a matter of fact, any art that you see is always the manifestation of an already completed project. The artist, this artist, sees something in, in his mind very clearly, has a good sense of what it is he wants. He makes the picture, it's there. When he makes the object, the painting, the sculpture, whatever, all he's doing is making it available to you. He's saying, I already have the picture. This is all done. I don't really need to do it anymore. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put it down so that I can share that vision that I have at the moment with you and see if you like it. Now, you may not. Now, you may. Guys who work like I do have to accept at the very beginning, from the top, that maybe 2 3% of the people that look at the art are going to go, whoa. They're going to plug in. They're going to think the way I think. Well, for me, that's enough. I mean, I don't need to hang in the Louvre. Uh, I've been back here painting like a, like a foolish old man and, and, and constructing crap all by myself, and it's been enough to sustain me. I look at it, the most important point in my entire life as an artist was when I was um, 34 years old. I started experimenting with glass started working with paint on glass and I I did about 20 or 30 pieces I was feeling my way trying to find out you know just what the hell works what this way this is something new I've never seen anything like it before and I was experimenting with it one day I finished a piece I put it up on the shelf and I looked at it totally objective as objective as, as is possible to be and I said to myself that's fucking good it's good. And for the first time in my life, I didn't need some other person to come and tell me, you're right, it is good. I didn't need that. I didn't need anyone else to come and verify my talents and my abilities. I knew that what I did held up. And from that day on, I was free. From that day on, I no longer concerned myself with wanting to go out and exhibit art and have other people write reviews about my art and have other people say, I want to buy it, I want blah, 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 whatever they want to say. No, it stopped mattering. The only thing that mattered, the only thing that mattered was that I was pleased. And in that way, maybe art sometimes is masturbatory. I don't know, <laughs> because it's, it's a self, it's, it's a, when it's really great, there's an interaction like sex. I mean, you, 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 you've got all this energy and this passion and you're passing it out and it's coming back from the viewer and there's that dynamic, it's like sex in a way. And then when you're all by yourself and you're painting and you know no one's ever gonna see this work, that's masturbation. Pure and simple, I guess, but whatever the case may be, it's satisfying, it's pleasing, and it works on its own. Uh, you're seeing my stuff right now. 
and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to finally get someone else to look at what I've been doing. Because it's been sitting here, I'm being crowded out by my own art. Being crowded out completely. My, my art mocks me. I've got so much crap here, <laughs> I'm drowning in my own art. So I'm doing this in the, in the hope, maybe vainglory, but in the hope that somebody out there will go, I'll relieve this poor son of a bitch of some of this crap so he's got more room so he can make more art. That's what I need. I need more room so I can make more art. My work, all of it, is my, my, my family. Each piece of art that I make is a child of mine. And some of them are good children, and some of them are bad children, and some of them are delinquents and worth nothing, and some of them are geniuses and are going to go you know, to the moon. They're going to do great things. I myself am not a good judge of that. Uh, I, I, only, I, I only know that they're, they're mine and they are pieces of me and that long after I'm dead some of this shit, some of it is going to be around. Somewhere somebody's going to have a piece of, of Rico Gargiulo's artwork. It doesn't really matter where you go in this country. If you're an artist and you want to be exhibited, you want to get shown, seen, uh, there aren't that many avenues for you to go to. Uh, mostly, most people go to galleries bring in slides of their work and try to get the gallery interested in their, their stuff and uh, get them committed to an exhibition, which is uh, fine. If you're lucky, you'll get one. Now, when I got my first exhibition, it was Feidelson, who put in a call to the gallery owner and said, you've got to give this guy a show. So I didn't have to break any barriers. I just walked in and got the show. But for the average guy or woman, uh, you do a lot of, lot of uh, foot treading. You walk around quite a bit and you get turned down a lot. The problem is this. I think I, I mentioned this before. There are just so many galleries and number one, there is a shitload of artists, number two, and the average gallery can't have more than 12 to 24 clients that they exhibit. I talked about that. What I didn't talk about is the fact that even if they choose you, even if they say, yeah, we, we uh, really love your work, you have to come up with the money for advertising, you have to come up with the money for the opening night festivities, champagne, uh, whatever treats you want to give the audience. You give them 35% of whatever sales are made, and you pay for their rent for the month, or for the two-week period, depending on the length of the exhibition. So if, if you have to sell at least two or three, maybe four paintings per show, just to break even. If you're an unknown artist, that's a pretty difficult thing. The unknown artists generally sell one, maybe two. You know, there'll be some interest. Uh, people will come back, want to look at it. You'll be hanging there for a couple of weeks, and uh, maybe you'll sell over the period of time two or three pieces. But you walk away, not having made a cent, not making a cent. And for all of that, you go through the anxiety of the opening night, hanging the paintings, making sure that everything is working perfectly, making sure that all the people on the guest list are there. It is a nightmarish experience. And when you go through it you're depleted by the time the thing's over and you often wish you'd never done it to begin with. Well, that's where I, I walked out. I had five exhibitions. I was in Mexico City, I was in Paris, I was in uh, San Francisco, a couple of showings here in Los Angeles. Uh, the bottom line on all of them was I really lost money when everything was done and said and done. I lost money. So I said, the hell with it. I just can't get into that anymore. I can't do the, the, the game. I can't play the game. And so that was when the gate uh, became the deal. When I said, no, I'm just going to work for myself. I'm not going to you know, get out there and play that game and throw that kind of money around and get nothing for my efforts. It is very heartbreaking. I mean, there's nothing worse. You get there's so much anxiety and apprehension. I'm going to have a show. I'm going to have a show. And, it, and, it, and they're all there and people are looking and blah, blah, blah. And then at the end of the month, he, he, you know, I sold two pieces. Gee, uh, uh, fuck. So uh, that's why I stopped going out and showing my work. That's why you're seeing it for the first time, because I haven't been able to play that game. I haven't been able to get in that swimming pool. I just can't swim. The water's too cold, and I don't do it anymore. So, you know, you've met me, and you've seen my art, and that's good for me, and that was a big pleasure. But uh, there's one thing you take away from this thing besides seeing my stuff, and hopefully, you know, wanting to get involved with my creativity process. Uh, you got to think as an example, I'm, I'm, I'm great. You know, if you're young, if you're middle-aged, if you're, if you're, you know, collecting Social Security, remember, I mean, at 75 years of age, 
I'm still kicking ass. So like, I should be a good model for people. Look at me. It's never over till it's over, as long as you're out there and moving and grooving, and, because in the end, how you feel, yeah, that's important. But what you do is what really counts. Don't sit on your ass and dry up and don't get paranoid. Just do shit. Do shit, create shit, and have fun. That's my message to you. That's it. You know, friends of mine told me that I'm a little bit crazy because I live behind this big gate, paint, paint, sculpt, sculpt, have no contact with the outside world, and uh, I think I'm a little screw loose, you know. But I can tell you the truth, I'm not crazy. <laughs>